Good evening. I hope everybody settles down. Good evening. We have with us uh, two very eminent economists, thinkers, practitioners of policy. How do you define serendipity? Dr. Ahluwalia is the former chair, uh, deputy chairman of the Planning Commission. Dr. Rajiv Kumar is the vice chairman of the current avatar of the Planning Commission. An interesting anecdote here. In January 1990, Dr. Rajiv Kumar and Dr. Kelkar produced a paper on what to do, how to open up the economy under my guru, S. Venkatramnan. Dr. Aluwalia produced the very famous M document, also in 1990. And in June 1990, Amarnath Varma and Rakesh Mohan produced a paper on how to liberalize the economy. The interesting thing is, all the three doc documents were available, but the government of the day, led by VP Singh, supported on the right by BJP, on the left by the left front, didn't do nothing and India's liberalization had to await a crisis. So we have an interesting duet here, and that brings us the past and the present to look at the future. The question we are looking at today is the development paradigm. Take, if you take away all the many words around it, the question is, the idea of the $5 trillion economy, is it rhetoric or is it reality? I would like to ask Dr. Rajiv Kumar first, what's the deadline? What's the deadline for the $5 trillion economy? Earlier it was 24-25, now we've had the pandemic and the setbacks. Uh, it would be interesting if you could lay out a roadmap on how the uh, idea is going to be achieved. And then I would uh, ask Dr. Alwalia to sort of uh, come in with his insights. Thanks, Ankar. Good afternoon, everybody. Well, I mean, you know, um, I'm... You have to agree with me, Shankar, that it will take a very brave and perhaps a foolhardy man to lay down any roadmap at this point of time for any economy. economy. Given, given what we have you know, in, the, in the world going on at the moment and what we've had for the last two years, etc., I think uh, the uncertainties are so big. Uh, you know, we don't know the outcomes of the, what's going on in Europe at the moment. We don't know what's, how the commodity prices would be, how the oil will shape up, et cetera. And given the fact that India is deeply integrated into the global economy. Fair enough, Dr. So, so I, I think I, that's the first, first but, but you have to yeah, accept ca that yeah. caveat. Uh, the thing is that, the second part of the answer is that it's surely not a, not a rhetoric. And uh, you know, we, are at about, we are now at about $2.7 trillion economy already. And you know, what you need to do is to, let's say, double it. And uh, depending on the rate of growth, which I, th which I think, let's say this, that if, uh, but this is so, such a difficult sentence to make, that say that uh, if things remain normal, you don't get a fourth wave of the pandemic, or you don't get you know, some uh, ghastly outcome in Ukraine, et cetera, then you can achieve uh, eight, percent growth because we've done that, eight and a half percent growth for a you know, sustained period of time. All the conditions are in place and I can go into detail at this point of time. And if you do eight and a half percent rate of growth, you can achieve a, a doubling of the economy, you know, in, in less than, in less than, in, in about eight years, seven years. And so by, by, by the time you get to, before you get to 2030, you should be a five trillion dollar economy for sure. So and, yeah. what would be, uh, approximate deadline, five years? Sorry? What would be the leap, uh, the, the curve, like five years down the line? No, uh, there, there is no leap required at the moment because as I said, 
we've achieved 8.5%, 9% growth, and 85 for a sustained period 2003 to 2011. We did that. And I think that same can be repeated now, provided international conditions, global yeah, all, conditions all remain the same. And uh, as I said, and, I, and this, is, this is something that we need to emphasize, that the foundations for such a growth in all respects, the difficult reforms, you know, the, 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 the attempt to cede more space to the private sector, the government's commitment uh, that private investor will be the driving force for this economy, and, and all the things that they've done in, recent, uh, in, in the these last two years and then in the previous five years, all those reforms have laid the foundation, in my view, of you, you know that in the 22, 23, we will get 8, 8.5% rate of growth, everybody agrees to that. And I think that can be sustained. But let me just say one thing here, and very briefly, which is that we must recognize the fact that India is perhaps the only country which will have to achieve this rate of growth while taking care fully of the environment. It cannot be treated as a trade-off. We don't have the option of having this growth and then retrofitting later. And that makes the task more difficult. Because that makes the task that you, your energy intensity, your share of renewable energies, you know, all of that has to go up. So what we need to do is to think very differently from what we've done in the past. And just one other example, just for example, that we achieved all the success in agriculture that we have done. But now we know that that whole paradigm of the green revolution, biochemical agriculture, has now seen its, you know, as it were, its end. Because the organic carbon content in the soil is 0.5%, while it's 1.5% is required to keep it arable. Now, to get the carbon back in the soil, you need a very different form of agriculture, cropping patterns, you know, water sustainability, all of that. So the challenges are there, but government recognizes those challenges only to say that it's, 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 it's very facile to assume some rates of growth. But we, we need to think differently, we need to think in, you know, in, in, in a manner which probably no other model in the world has, has, has before us. If we do that, and I'm sure we will, we will achieve this 8.5%, 9% rate of growth, and therefore we will achieve the doubling of the economy in, in less than eight years going forward. Less than? Eight years. Eight years, okay. Dr. Alwalia, when you wrote the M document, when Rajiv and Dr. Kelkar produced those documents, India's GDP was roughly around $300 billion. Now it's approaching $3 trillion. The idea of $5 trillion seems achievable, seems doable. In your assessment, given all your experience, how much of what the government is doing is promoting that kind of growth, and where do you think the roadblocks are? <clears throat> well, First of all, thank you for inviting me. You know, I just want to check with the audience. Can you actually hear what we are saying? Because the sound is very muffled to me. Oh, you can't hear. Yeah, I think we need a bit of a... Is this, oops, is this better? Okay. Um, no, I think let me just say that uh, this whole business of uh, reaching a particular trillion dollars, this is a slogan. And slogans are very important. I mean, they're catchy. Uh, but to say we're going to reach $5 trillion is not very different from saying we're going to aim at a certain growth rate. And the traditional metric uh, by which overall performance has been judged has been growth rate of GDP. And government changed that to uh, reaching a certain trillion dollar level. I don't think that matters. Either way, what is important is to convert the trillion dollars into the growth rate that you need to get there. And that has the immense advantage that you can measure your progress year by year. I mean, for example, I think as uh, Rajiv has rightly pointed out, holding the government to reaching 5 trillion by 2024 is not fair. Because the fact is, you've had a pandemic, you've lots of other things. It's been a very unusual period. So now let's look at the revised target, which is, I'm told, 
$10 trillion by 2030. So we are now got back, we've got back to the same level of output that we were before the pandemic. So you can say that the short-term impact of the pandemic is now behind us. Hopefully we won't have another pandemic, nobody's sure. But we're now talking about the next nine years. And if you were to rephrase your question, that is $10 trillion by 2030 feasible? The way as an economist from outside, I would address that question is what does it mean for the growth rate? Now the Indian economy today is about 2.95 trillion, according to all yeah. these usual estimates. In order to reach something close to 10 trillion by 2030, and allowing 3% as an international inflation rate in dollar terms, okay? Uh, it will have to grow at 11% per year for nine years. So you have to rephrase the question, um, are we putting forth a program that will achieve an 11% growth per year in real terms over the next nine years? Now, by the way, if a government commits itself to that, I think that's wonderful. I mean, everybody would like the economy to grow rapidly, but then you can address the question, uh, are we doing enough? Now, let me just put it by way of background. Even China, over a long period, didn't average more than 10%. So if you were to force me, I would say that's an unrealistic target. And, you know, one view is uh, a target that's 20, 30 years, you know, far enough away that you might as well savor the joy of $10 trillion and not get too bugged by what does it mean in terms of growth rates. But on the other hand, if you want a reasonable assessment of short-term performance, my guess would be that uh, we have gone through the pandemic now. Uh, we are reasonably positioned to get back under normal circumstances to what would be good growth, but we are still staring at a global crisis uh, which is the, the length and duration of which is uncertain because we just don't know how long the Russian-Ukraine crisis is going to last, what's it going to do to oil prices, Are they, is this a temporary thing and it's all going to come down. Uh, most of the international chapters do not think it's temporary. So quite frankly, uh, it will take a lot of time even to pick up growth. If you take the long period of the previous, uh, forget the slow down immediately before the pandemic. Because for the two, three years before the pandemic, the economy had slowed down. It's a separate issue why. Some people think uh, temporary effects of demonetization and the disruption of GST, although the GST was an excellent move, but temporarily it did disrupt. So for whatever reason, it slowed down. So let's ignore that. What was the long-term performance? If you combine the UPA period with the better growth period of the current government first three years, the average is only about 7%. And that is during a period when the world economy was doing reasonably well. So quite frankly, I think if we, if somebody said to me, look, we should be aiming at, let's say 8%, I would say that's, you've got to have a little, I mean, Dr. Manmohan Singh used to say that a man's uh, reach must exceed his grasp. So we would need to have a little bit more uh, ambitious targets, 8%, and if you get to 7, you declare victory. That's the range, I think, and that's the, that would require terrific policies. Now, if you want to know what are those policies, I would only say that those policies have changed quite a bit. I mean, you mentioned Rajiv wrote a paper in 1990, and Rakesh Mohan also, and I also. I mean, economists are always writing papers. It, it goes, it's an <laughs> occupational hazard. But the important thing is, 1991 was a, a set of no-brainer decisions. Remember, we were, we were totally out of the curve. We were following policies that virtually nobody else was. We were late in changing them, I'm glad we did, and we did well. But you know, today, uh, it's a whole different world. Uh, in those days, uh, the, there was a great consensus that the world is integrating globally. Right now, it's doing anything but. 
is breaking up into uh, different kind of um, regional groupings. Yeah. So what should be our policy is an open question which we need to address. I mean, there are some obvious things we have to do, which is just a continuation of what we started. But I think there are deeper, more complicated things which hopefully uh, in the world of policy discussion will be picked up. Okay, um, fair enough. The caveat being the uncertainty and uh, our long-range growth rate, uh, the potential for... Uh, Not just uncertainty, the world has changed. Yeah. I mean, you've got climate change staring at you, which you didn't have in 1991. So before, before the pandemic, there were three disruptions, which is basically demographic disruption, then the technology and the climate change. And thereafter, now we have the geopolitical, yes. the world order disruption. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, we have Shashi here, who's a former external affairs minister. Maybe we'll get him into the discussion as to what Ukraine will. And later in the day, today, Farid is here, so he's going to speak on uh, what he sees happening. Uh, whether there will be one trade block, two trade blocks, whether dollar will dominate, yuan will come in, or we will have a change. But the spirit of the question, whether we'll reach $5 trillion, is largely around what's the state of reforms, the domestic reforms. Given the other issues, let's look at uh, the state of reforms. So we always talk about Gen Next reforms. To me, Gen Next reforms always is the next generation reforms, which is Yashwan Sinha introduces 26% FDI in insurance. Then uh, his son, uh, Jayan Sinha, has to come and take it to 49%. So we have a Sinha to Sinha reforms uh, curve in this country. But the bigger question is that we, we know that it there is we all typically Indians look at reforms as uh, one deity, which is the center, and one prayer, which is the budget. But actually, the real reforms have to happen in the states. And in your experience, I'm going to come to you, Dr. Alwalia, in a minute. But Dr. Rajiv Kumar, factors of productivity, land, labor, shackled in the states. Power sector reforms also stalled in the states. We talk about privatization in the center, but we don't talk about privatization in the states. I mean, there isn't a single state where the PSUs make more money than they lose. So, and the ruling dispensation now, NDA, is in power in at least 18 states. Yeah. So now, now, you've been in Niti Aayog, which looks at the states and all. What, I mean, I'm not criticizing. This government has done certain things spectacularly. The Jandan Yojana, the financialization of savings, the rural electrification program. I'm a bit iffy about the Jal Jeevan thing, and we can come to that later. But why isn't even the ruling party states not accepting reforms that are being propagated by the center? No, you know. I think it's, it's very important what you've done, and which is that we have to shift the conversation away from Delhi. Because it's states is where the rubber meets the road. States is where action is going to be, and is. And Niti Aayog, actually, one of the principal mandates, which we are now pushing very hard, is to engage with the states. In fact, what we're trying to do is that for each state in India, we're trying to encourage them to develop their own blueprints for growth and development, because every state is so different. I mean, there's nothing common between Manipur and Gujarat, you know, or, or, or between JNK and Tamil Nadu. And we just recently brought out what was called the Export Preparedness Index, and we divided the states between coastal states and landlocked states, and there are some states like the Punjab, which are double landlocked, etc. You can't have an exim policy pan in India, which is what we've done for the last 70 years. And therefore, what we are trying to do now is for every state to try and develop its own you know, ex export policy, appoint export commissioners, and so on. So that you, you're absolutely right. But this is changing. And this is changing because of what we call competitive federalism, which Niti Aayog is pushing in the sense of bringing out indices. And we now brought out about 11 of them, where we rank the states and put them out in the public domain. And we try and encourage them to compete with each other to show that, look, this is what you, now this is, this includes, you know, your, your health index, this includes the export preparedness, the innovation index, you know, the school education, etc. So all of those reforms have to be done there. 
but what are the instruments of encouraging the states and engaging them? Th that's what we need to think through, because each, you know, the constitutional, uh, you know, the situation is that every state, you know, all those are state subjects and they would like to do that. Now, you will recall that on the 15th of August, the Honorable Prime Minister, I haven't heard anybody else say that, talked about regulatory and compliance burden in this country, 67,000 of them. And all of them, the great majority of them, are there in the states. And now Niti Aayog is engaging with each, each state, and, you know, and some of them, are, I lead the effort to say that, look, let's drop a list, and drop a list to say how we make private investment, private business, entrepreneurship more viable, more feasible, and how do we, how does the, you know, the, the sort of obstructionist part of the government gets out of the way and cedes the space, you know, to that. Now, whether the states will privatize their PSUs is, is an open question because not many have done it, but at least the government of India has now set a, I think, an ex amazing example by finally clinching Air India, by announcing that two of the you know, public sector banks will be privatized. They've announced that, and, and, and the process is ongoing, and by talking about the IPO for LIC, et cetera. So, but, you know, you remember the time when, and I was in the government then, and, and, uh, and when Montague was my boss, when privatization was not, was, not a bad, was not a word to be used in India. We had we coined a word called, uh, what is it, disinvestment. And the Department of Disinvestment was created. But at least now that's happening. So the entire, you know, the, so, so the, you know, the, the environment, the ecosystem is changing. But the other big thing, uh, Shankar, is that we also not ever before emphasized accountability and delivery of public services and their accountability there, and improved governance. Now here, for example, we're taking, and you would notice that 400 schemes now, more than 400, are the benefits are transferred directly to the beneficiaries, you know, and, and not through intermediaries. And, and, and because of the jam trinity that, that's now being used. Moreover, the development, we have a monitoring and evaluation office in Niti IO, which actually monitors all the 370 central sponsored schemes and evaluates them on outputs and, outlay, uh, and outcomes, and not on, not, on, not, not on the outlays that you're making. That will change, and that is changing, beginning to change the governance, uh, you know, the governance function. And that's, by the way, the key. And that is, we are trying to take it to the states. But, and it will take time. But nonetheless, I think, uh, if you talk about Gujarat, or if you talk about UP now, or you talk about, you know, or Himachal, or, or, you know, or Haryana, these states, which are the ruling party states, are following the central government's lead in taking the reforms that they should be taking. And, and uh, I think have accepted the fact that they will cede the space and they will use the government machinery to facilitate and promote private investment and not talk about commanding heights, et cetera, et cetera. So that much is clear now. There's a consensus, I think, across the states that it is the private sector, it is the private investor, which will be the driver for growth in India, and the government and the corporate sector, the private corporate sector, have to work hand in hand uh, to, to drive the engine forward. Let me place a couple of facts here. It is true that what is measured can be improved, and the, the way to improvement is to measure things. Now, we know about the compliance burden, the number of laws, 65,000 compliances, I don't know how many people in the audience know that there are 25,000 clauses in various laws in the country from Factories Act. Now, one of them, incidentally, is if you don't have a spittoon in your factory, you could be penalized, jailed. Imagine having a spittoon in a pharma company and the USFAD sort of clearing you. So those, we are still living with those kind of laws. But more importantly, Rajiv, look at the power sector, there, were, there was a bailout in 2000, 2002 when Suresh Prabhu was there, there was a bailout after that, there was a bailout in Uday, and now again, all cumulative losses of all state electricity boards is 5.4 lakh crores. I mean, the outstandings are 1 lakh crores. Now, 18 of those states are ruling party states. If you look at labor law, only five of those 18 states where the NDA is in power have endorsed the new code. I'm, I'm not saying that this is an easy task, 
But this is a political challenge that needs to be articulated. I wanted to take this question to Dr. Alwalia. In your experience, now that you have the benefit of the retrospective view and you were a coalition of over 15 parties, different parties in different states, why is it so difficult to get states to come into this? I mean, we have vibrant Gujarat, great Karnataka, all this investment uh, things. But I don't see, nobody uh, is talking about uh, a vibrant Kisan conference, for instance. But a, a larger question is, why is it so difficult to get states to employ teachers, fill up the posts of police people or health people, where does the, is it money, is it intent, or is it easier to do transfers? Well, all very, very good and very tough questions. You know, I think one thing is very clear. I agree with what you said, that, uh, and what Rajiv also said, that in a very important sense, uh, the area where the state, the state in a political sense, has to improve its performance hugely is now constitutionally in the domain of the state government. I mean, everybody knows that we are pretty backward on education, pretty backward on health, and those are really areas in the domain of state governments. Uh, it's also true that you, what you mentioned about the power sector. You know, distribution of power <clears throat> is entirely in the hands of state governments. And the unviability of the power sector is entirely due to the fact that the distribution system isn't working. I mean, there was a time when people felt that only a government organization can set up power station. That's no longer true. I mean, for many, many years now, we've demonstrated that private guys will set up power stations, but private guys do not sell directly to consumers, they sell to a distribution company, which in all almost all states is state-owned, with a few exceptions. Now, if you ask me, why is it that state governments of very different political persuasions have not moved to, in effect, privatize the distribution of power, if not for the whole state, at least for selected centers, I honestly don't have an answer. And I can only imagine that there isn't the political pressure on the part of people saying, look, this is your area. There is no excuse for non-performance. And I think this is the same thing holds for health and education. I mean, ultimately, look, an elected government responds to what its electors feel are the things it should deliver on, by and large. I can only assume that in our system, that is somehow not a pressure that state governments feel. Otherwise, they would be spending much more energy in getting these things done. You talked about not filling posts. Frankly, uh, that is the consequence of their financial status. I mean, most of them are not in a position to actually spend the money needed to fill posts on a regular basis. The point being that if you do that, then you just have to pay. It's much easier to hire contract teachers, underpay them, not fill posts, mainly because the financial situation of far too many states is very, very poor. And I don't have a simple solution. I mean, I'm glad that the debate is shifting so that people are now asking state governments, what are you going to do? I'm sure the state governments are going to the center and saying, bail us out. Maybe in a few cases it might happen, but that's just not a viable thing over a longer period. And let's just hope that the political process sends the right signals to state governments of different political complexions. I mean, this is a general problem. It's not with any one yeah. state. Shankar, just, just yeah. to add here on the, on the power sector, you know, it's, uh, you know, and all of us know that it's such a hugely politically vexed issue. And large part of it is actually because of the use of free power in agriculture. So really the thing goes down to changing the paradigm in agriculture, right? 90% of our water is used in agriculture and all of that is you know, drawn out to the ground. 
So therefore, what you need to do is to go beyond just talking power and its losses, but to say that, look, how do we change this entire thing? And now what we are trying to do, therefore, is that for renewable power, for example, now what we have said is that interstate transmission charges will not be levied. The, the, you know, the open access system that was done in 2003 will be enforced for renewable power. And the answer would be technology. And that's what this government is committing itself to. The answer is that if you can get hydrogen, green hydrogen, which is solar plus hydrogen, et cetera, and the technology brings its cost down to, as the Reliance has promised, one, 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 one dollar per kilogram in one decade, then this whole vexed question of power, you know, which is, you know, that we're talking about, can be tackled. But you have to look beyond the old formulas. You have to look beyond saying that, look, you know, everybody has to start charging. It won't happen, right? Instead, the trend is reversed. So let's use technology and let's look at and let's try and, you know, promote that in a bigger way. And that's not been done in India very often, which is what I think Niti Aayog is trying to do and this government is trying to do, to okay. depend on innovation <clears throat> and technology. I'm a prisoner of the clock there, so I'm going to raise two important questions. One is the centrality of growth, the $5 trillion or $10 trillion target, the centrality of the question rests on the fact that 42% of the labor depends on 16% of the national income, which is agriculture. And we've had different attempts to change the farm laws. Uh, that recent uh, Supreme Court report, I mean, committee's report has come. It has said that 60 or 70% of the uh, farm organizations agreed with it. In the last five to seven years, if you look at the track record of various parties' manifestos, they agreed to agricultural reforms in some form or the other, in some depth or the other, and almost all of them wanted to open up access to markets. What is it that can be done? Because this government took the step, you can argue how it was done, whether it was the, there was enough uh, discussion or not, all those things can be taken up. But now that you have done a U-turn on this, Rajiv, this government has done a reversal of those th three farm laws. Can these farm laws be taken up by the state governments now? Maybe the states where the BJP is in power can take up those laws. How do you fix agriculture? I mean, if you see every state, almost every state has a quota war going on. The Jats, the Gujars, the Marathas, the Patels, these are land-owning communities who want reservations which is primary indicator that agriculture doesn't pay, it's less viable than ever before. So what can be done for agriculture? So, uh, it's a very important and a very complex question, actually, about, and you said 50%, depending on 16, 18%, and so on. Um, and I think the way we are looking at it is one to start talking to the state governments to encourage them to change the cropping pattern that they've got into with the, because of the pricing structure, et cetera, you know, and which is very, you know, it's very biased towards water intensive crops and crops which we don't need any longer. I mean, the statistics is that our growth rate, rate of growth of production of cereals and grains is higher when our population is actually now stabilizing in the latest NFHS uh, five report says, you know, that we've reached the sort of stable So you did value moment. addition, different kinds of crop, horticulture, crop. all those what things. what we are, what I have been now supporting, and the, the Prime Minister supported that on the 16th of November and then repeated again, is actually to start what we call agroecology and to, to really sort of push back the biochemical revolution, the green revolution thing, because that has run its course. And the marginal product of fertilizer is now going down very sharp. The response rate is now much lower, and therefore what happens is that you keep dumping more chemical fertilizer, use much more water with free power, and the farmer doesn't get the return because, you know, because the costs just keep going up and the returns are not enough. So what we are now proposing for is actually to what we call chemical-free agriculture. And that's now, you know that there's a science behind it, 
the German Bundestag actually just declared, has, has, has taken a situation that they will give their aid now only to those who are practicing agroecology. And agroecology, which means that you use much less chemicals and very much more optimum the use of water. You can do the Israeli techniques you know, of uh, you know, optical sensors, drip, drip irrigation, nutrigation, et cetera. Plus, you could also start moving towards you know, what, is, what is called natural farming. So agriculture needs a whole paradigm shift here. And unless we do that, we, cannot, we will not be able to get the farmers in a position where their net incomes will increase because the cost will go down and the prices. And, and one other thing, which is that our agriculture so far is not, you know, 10 percent of our agricultural output is processed. It's a shame. Uh, nearly 20 percent of it is wasted. 92,000 crores is the wastage it's the waste. cost. Now, all that has to change, but that requires the attention of, of the central government and the states, but very different, you know, very different blueprints for different states. And that's what you need to do. But agriculture requires mo the most uh, focused policy attention for a sustained period, because easy answers are not going to come by. Dr. Waliwalia, in during your time in, uh, when you were in the PMO, when we, in, in the VP Singh government, and later uh, during the UPA period, uh, there's been attempts to bring in drip irrigation, incentivized drip irrigation. There have been attempts to think of a new uh, crop map for India. Uh, in your estimation, what went wrong with the uh, way in which the farm laws were reformed? Uh, I remember during Atal Bihari Vajpayee's time, uh, the, the, the narrative had shifted. During Dr. Manmohan Singh's time, it was uh, consensus on reforms, and during Vajpayee's time, he had introduced a new element in it, which is reforms by consent. So, what 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 went wrong in this? I mean, what could be done? Look, I think the um, that's going back a very long way, hmm. uh, and I'm not sure that's very productive because the honest truth is, if you look at the reforms that were started in '91. Uh, a humongous amount of things got done. Hmm. Uh, yes, some things didn't get done, uh, but the important thing is what should we do now? And I don't think it matters what we did right, wrong then. The central point, which I think you, you started with, is that, look, any reform in agriculture is in the constitutional realm of the states. So if you had a state chief minister saying, I have now consulted the best people in my state, in the country, and what have you, and I want to do this, the Constitution allows him to do it. I think the problem with the farm laws, I mean, by the way, I was in favor earlier in these broad directions of the we must modernize marketing, allow the private sector, and all of this is something I agreed with. The problem was that our assessment was that constitutionally, this has to be done by the state, so we would be lecturing the states, and they wouldn't be doing anything about it. The present government came to the conclusion that constitutionally, the center can legislate. So they did that. Maybe there wasn't enough consultation. So it became a political confrontation. But if, the sta if any state wants, and all states don't have to do the same thing, if any state wants that this is my agricultural solution, and it doesn't include getting more money from the government of India, there's absolutely nothing stopping them. See, the other side is that if you want to go into, um, I mean, Rajiv rightly said you want to move away from chemical inputs. So if you're going to move away from chemical inputs, the first thing to do is stop for, uh, subsidizing them. It's going to be very difficult to build a productive agriculture using non-chemical inputs, which you don't subsidize, while continuing to subsidize fertilizer as much as we're doing. So actually, the, the thing the center has to do is if, it, if it's able to, and by the way, previous governments were aware of this and were not able to do it, would be to rethink the fertilizer subsidy. It's highly distortional, it damages the soil, but nobody is willing to get up and say, so look, the, the big mistake is to think we must get rid of the fertilizer subsidy because we can't afford it. The correct thing is we should say, look, 
We're spending X thousand crores on the fertilizer subsidy. We want to give the same amount to farmers, but not via the chemical fertilizer subsidy, via something else. So it's not seen as an anti-farmer, pro-fiscal thing. Hasn't been done so far. And that's a real problem. That's politics. I mean, you know, it's a... Uh... I just wanted to <clears throat> take... Do I have five minutes? Yeah, okay. So I just wanted to take a uh, crystal ball view from both of you. In all that's happening around the Ukraine, the yuanization of the oil trade, uh, the surprise visit of the Chinese foreign minister into India, there is a perception that there will be three distinct blocks of trade now, the dollar block, the yuan block, and the rest of us were the neutral block. Who will... Is this an opportunity for India in terms of, obviously, people, there is going to be a move away from, I mean, we already have this semantics called China plus one policy, you know, resilience, regionalization, deglobalization. Is this an opportunity for India to sort of build its case build an economy, I mean, take uh, whatever is moving away from China, moving away from uh, the, what the West considers the authoritarian bloc. Is there an opportunity for India? First, Rajiv, I would ask you, and then I'm coming to them. Shankar, I, uh, I, I just hope the, break, the world doesn't break up into blocks. And because if it does, then that would be a completely new order. You know, I mean, uh, maybe Pax Americana is going to be weakened and so on, come what may. But my thing here is that, yes, there is an opportunity for India to now push even harder for a rule-based multilateral order system in, in, the, in the world. True. And to change that and to, and to, and to, and to talk even louder that the Bretton Woods institutions, the IMF, World Bank, the WTO, the GATT and WTO, uh, they have to be revi revamped, rejuvenated, but in a manner that, what you, that, that the, the rule-based order remains and there is no sort of a hegemonic, you know, um, um, sort of presence there, which, can, which, which acts selfishly, whether it's the US or China or Russia or whatever. And there I think uh, what you need to do, and G20 represents that to a certain extent, is to bring what I call the intermediate powers together. Now, whether India will ha be able to play that role is an open question. My own understanding, which I keep saying to wherever I can, is that for India, the best foreign policy is at the moment to improve your domestic economy. It's to improve your domestic economy. You know, and, and therefore, sort of, you know, and because once you, unless you do that, uh, your, your, you know, your, your writ is not, you know, you'll be seen as always punching above your weight. And this is a very, very good time because there's a deep, there's a huge interest out there. And people come and meet me all the time you know, to be able to do so. I think, so if we focus on that and yet at the same time, keep talking about strengthening the role of intermediate economies, intermediate uh, powers uh, for a better rejuvenated rule-based multilateral trading order, I think that's the way to go forward. Dr. Alwalia, one of the many hats that you've worn in government, I think I remember, is was Commerce Secretary at some point. Uh, and, and in during your time in uh, Planning Commission, you, you were also an advocate of uh, the free trade agreements. Uh, do you see this crisis <coughs> in the world order? I do agree with Rajiv that I hope that uh, the existing world order that we have doesn't get dismantled, but I'm, I must confess I'm a pessimist on that. Uh, uh, because the well, challenge is coming. So do you think there's an opportunity for India? Do we, should we do more bilaterals? Do we, uh, is there like scope to get into the game really? Well, let me, that sign of yours is flashing zero, zero. So 
I realize that I have very little time. No, no, you have Second, time. You have time. You have time. Hmm. That's what I like about budget constraints. You relax them whenever you want. <laughs> the real reason I'm hesitating is that, you know, it's very difficult to answer this question when you're sitting directly in front of Farid Zakaria. Mm -hmm. Because I really want to ask him this question when he's on the podium. So I would urge you, listen carefully to what he has to say. My own view is that while we can keep hoping for a resuscitation of the rule-based multilateral system, uh, in the foreseeable future, the world is heading into separation into these different blocks. I don't see that being reversed. Is that an opportunity? It certainly indicates that we should rethink our mechanical assertions that we must integrate with the multilateral order. I mean, that's not there for the next 10 years. There are these three blocks, and it's quite clear that uh, the balance of advantage for, actually the balance of advantage for us is to integrate with the Europeans to the extent to which we can, and of course to the Asian bloc, which in a way includes Japan, South Korea, et cetera, and so on, and all our quad partners are there, but they're not actually uh, yet a trade bloc. So the real issue is that uh, we didn't join RCEP, which I thought at one point we were going to. I think industry lobbied intensely uh, and dissuaded the government from doing it. But I can understand that in the case of RCEP, since China was a member, a lot of Indian industry feel that it's very difficult to compete with China because they're non-transparent. Well, the other alternative is to sign up with what the Japanese are doing, which is preparing a much deeper integration. It's not just free trade, it's a more deep integration, the old TPP minus the US. The assumption being that if the Japanese can deliver something, then in, in some of its more sensible moments, the United States may join it. You never know two, three years down the road. India has an opportunity to actually join that. And while every argument we have traditionally made, especially from the Commerce Ministry, by the way, historically, the Commerce Ministry has been consistently against any form of liberalization. They were totally opposed <laughs> to the liberalization we did in 1991. <laughs> So the ministry is hardwired uh, to argue the way they do in Geneva, that, you know, you should liberalize and we don't have to liberalize. It made a lot of sense when we were zeros, but we can't simultaneously say we are going to be a $10 trillion economy at some unknown point in the future, but we're not going to do anything. So quite frankly, we should ask ourselves, why not join what the Japanese are saying? Now, that would be a, that's an opportunity. It's highly controversial. So I think you should get, you have a lot of very distinguished business people attending this. You should give them a little slip, saying, do you agree that we should do it or no? And send me an email saying, well, how many pluses and how many minuses? But I think this has not been adequately discussed, either in academic life or in our strategic thinking community, or for that matter, in business. But it is a really important issue. I. I must confess, Dr. Alwalia, this has been a very good discussion. Thank you, Dr. Rajiv Kumar. Thank you, Dr. Alwalia. My confidence, I don't share your confidence in the business. Uh, corporates actually speaking their mind, not even if it is an anonymous poll. But here's, I, I like the idea. I had written last year that India has an opportunity to bring, build its own trade uh, uh, economic agreement thing, which is the G7, G20 may not be there, may be there. We, I'll hold my judgment till Farid speaks on this. But you could have a G2T, which is G $2 trillion plus economies. There are 11 of them. They could build, they could be a trade bloc. They're all democracies. So there is an opportunity there. I will leave it at that. And one last word for Avinash Pandey, if I can see him somewhere here, is that Avinash, most of the channels, everybody covers the union budget in great detail for six, seven hours. It might help, actually, if we give two hours for every state and its budget. I think PRS legislative does, does some work. The one question I've asked five state governments is how much unspent cash they were sitting on at the end of 2022. None of the states are replying. Thank you. 
Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Ayer, Dr. Aluwalia, Dr. Kumar. We really appreciate your time and request you to remain on stage. We'd also like to acknowledge the presence of and very warmly welcome Fareed Zakaria, who's in the house with us. Welcome to Ideas of India. Mr. Zakaria, we're really looking forward keenly to your keynote address. Ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to invite on stage ABP Network's Mohit Roy Sharma now to present a token of thanks to our esteemed speakers for this session. It's been a very insightful session where we've uh, taken a peek into how the country's finest economic minds are thinking about the roadmap to that $5 trillion economy. Thank you very much, Dr. Kumar and Dr. Aluwalia. And also a round of applause for Shankar Ayer, ladies and gentlemen.